So what was one of your favorite poems you've ever written? And can you read one to start? Th that favorite poem? Or whatever poem you want. OK. I, I think that, you know, when you've been writing as long as I have, I have a lot of poems that I've been very happy with because they, they were hard to write, and it took me a long time to have the nerve to write them. And, and also because people have responded to them and written me letters about them, and that feels so amazing, so amazing. I can't tell you. So I think I'm going to steal your book, and I'm going to read uh, one of the poems about my father, because those were some of the hardest poems for me to write, the, the poems about him. Um, mainly because I was so mean to him when I was growing up. I mean, he, didn't, he was working class, and I was embarrassed. He didn't speak English correctly, and I was embarrassed by that. And I wanted him to be this kind of upper-middle-class father. This poem is a very old poem. It's called Betrayals. And it's a poem that I wrote after I, I, I think other writers can help so much sometimes in having you see your work. And there was a writer named Ruth Lisa Schechter who came originally from Boston down to New York and then moved up to Croton on Hudson and started something called the Croton Review, which was a magazine. And she, I sent her poems for the magazine. She sent me a letter and she said, I really want to talk to you about your poems. She sent me a letter. And I was pretty much little Miss Housewife at that point. I never went anywhere. I mean, I never went anywhere far by myself at that point since I go all over the world now. It's kind of hard to imagine. But I was fairly young and I just, you know, I had been raising my children, going to school, teaching. I really never went much of anywhere by myself. So I drove up to Croton on Hudson, which was a hard thing for me to do. And when I got there, she spent about five hours with me going over my poems. And she said, go home and reread Kaddish, Allen Ginsberg's Kaddish. And I did that. And that, I revised this poem when I did that. Because I didn't understand how unspecific I was being, how I could be writing about anybody's father. And then I, I really think this poem still works, although it's very old at this point. And uh, so it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit different style, maybe not so much. Anyway, it's called Betrayals. At 13, I screamed, you're disgusting, drinking your coffee from a saucer. Your startled eyes darkened with shame. You, one dead leg dragging, counting your night shift hours. You, smiling, past yellowed, gaping teeth. You, mixing the eggnog for me yourself in a fat, dime store cup, how I betrayed you over and over, ashamed of your broken tongue, how I laughed, savage and innocent, at your mutilations. Today my son shouts, don't tell anyone you're my mother, hunching down the other in the car so the other boys won't see us together. Daddy, are you laughing? How things turn full circle, my own words coming back to slap my face. I was 16 when you called one night from your work. I called you dear, loving you in that moment past all the barriers of the heart. You called again every night for a week. I never said it again. I wish I could say it now. Dear, my dear, with your twisted tongue, I did not understand you carting your burden. Of love. Anyway, that was a hard poem for me to write, but it was the first poem in which I actually got specific and wrote a poem about my father that I think could not have been anybody else's father and yet builds a bridge between anybody running, between me and anybody else running, writing about their family. So you write a lot about personal experiences. Do you ever find that difficult? Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, I always say, you know when you've reached the cave because you start crying. So I always know when I'm going, getting a poem, getting to something I really need to write because I will start crying myself as I'm writing halfway through it or tears will be running down my face as I'm writing it. And without 
what happens with me is then that's the poem people write to me about. That's the poem people remember 25 years after they've heard me read. And I love that. I love having them come up to me and say, oh, I remember that poem. And then they, they don't recite the lines necessarily, but they tell the poem back to me. And they heard me 25 years ago in Nebraska. And I go, I didn't even think anybody would even understand me in Nebraska. But they do, because what I'm trying to write about is what it's like to be human. And I hope that builds a bridge between me and other people. I think that's what poetry does, builds that bridge. If it doesn't do that, what's the point? I don't want to be one of the five white guys from Harvard, not that I could be, one of the five white guys from Harvard writing for five other white guys from Harvard. I want, the way my father and mother were, they always greeted the world with very open arms. And my father was always out in the world trying to help people. And I think, in a way, the kind of poetry that I'm writing and the kind of classes I teach and the kind of poetry I'm suggesting people write is a poetry that reaches out to the world, that opens up to the world, that doesn't close everything in. And it's hard sometimes to write like that. But I think, it's the only, for me, it's the only thing that makes sense. I don't want a poem that's just pretty but doesn't have any guts in it. And you saw in that room today. You know when people are being gutsy and being brave. You know it. When people are telling the truth, you can hear it. So are there any topics that you just don't write about at all? Um, not really. There, there, there's almost nothing. Um, I always say that I love Sharon Olds's work, but I'm not sure that I would have the nerve to write about some of the things in in such specific detail that she does. Um, and that specific sexual scenes, I probably, I don't know. I just, I, it's not my thing to write that way. Uh, but once I have to tell you, am I allowed to tell you something? Okay, I will tell you something. Once. There was a, an article in, or a call for poems, and it, I think it was the back of Poets and Writers, and it was the poems about sex. So I writ, write my only poem, specific sex poem, and I send it off stupidly in the mail, in the, in, I think it was email at the time. And then I thought, oh my God, I just sent that poem to somebody, and who knows who's going to see it? Who knows? I'm thinking, what did you do? Are you insane? <laughs> You're a mother. You're a grandmother. What are you doing? How could you have sent him that poem? You don't know this man. So I, I really, that sort of taught me a lesson. I'm not, if I write that kind of poem, I keep it for me. You know, and I have written poems like that, but I don't publish. So those are the ones that I will not publish. Not because I think there are things that you shouldn't publish, but because I was so embarrassed when I said, I suddenly realized this guy could be a total pervert. And I'm sending this poem to him that was so specific. And I'm thinking, oh, God, he could, he could make me pay money for him not to publish this poem. <laughs> Um, I usually start with a line of some sort or a, a, something I need to write about. But less than what, you know, I used to start with reading a book, reading a book of poems, and then in the poem, something would get me started. Because when my children were little, the only time I had to myself, they even followed me into the bathroom because so I couldn't even write in the bathroom. Uh, you know, they hang on to you. so. They don't want to let you go. I wish they'd come back and hang on to me, but I guess they're not going to. Uh, but in any case, I found that I could get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I could write at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so I would read, and people like Adrian Rich and um, Sylvia Plath and Ann Sexton kept me company in the middle of the night, and Mae Sarton. And I would sit and I would read. And after I'd read two or three poems, I'd suddenly find myself writing in my journal about something that I was worrying about or somebody I, I cared about. And before I knew it, I was writing a poem. And so in a way, those midnight excursions into poetry 
taught me to just let go, that eventually if the poem needs to be written, it will come. Now, as I become more and more difficult, I do have two jobs after all, plus the running around doing poetry reading. So now I do a lot of writing when you guys are writing. My students are writing. I, I never miss an opportunity to write because I, know, I, I now can't get up in the middle of the night to write unless I'm having nightmares. So, you know, I, I really need to sleep in order to be able to do, lead the kind of life I lead, lead. So now I try to get as much writing in as I can while my students are writing. And I do a lot of intensive workshops, so I run, I write a lot. That's why I have so many books recently. Um, and it, so it's been, it's been wonderful for me. And it's also a way for me, when the students finish reading, I, I make myself read my poem, even though they might have written poems that are 10,000 times better than what I wrote, but I make myself read it because I want to show them that sometimes you make a fool of yourself. Sometimes you don't get it. You don't, it doesn't work. The, poems, the poem doesn't work, but you have to be brave, brave enough to go out. If you're asking them to go out on a limb, you need to go out on a limb too. So during that writing process, how do you overcome your crow? Oh, <laughs> I've had a lot of practice for one thing. Um, but I have to be careful because I will say, oh, this is no good. I find myself saying before I read the poem, this is no good or because I'm embarrassed because they've just written wonderful poems and then there I am coming home up with this poem that needs cutting and <laughs> needs a lot of work, and so I'm embarrassed, and so I make negative comments about it. That's my crow, and I, and I have tried to teach myself not to do that. I do have a tendency to make negative statements about myself. I never make negative statements about other people, but I, I have a tendency to make negative statements about myself, almost as though I'm trying to say it first before somebody else says it. So I'm trying to train myself out of it, but obviously I'm not exactly young and I haven't succeeded very well in that. I have to give myself permission to go where I have to go. And what happens, I don't know if this happens with you, but in, I might, the first 10 lines might be a little labored, but then as I get into the poem, I feel my pen moving and my pen is moving and my conscious mind is no longer in charge. The little old lady who lives in my belly is in charge. And I need her to be in charge because she knows more than my brain does about what I need to write. So when I get to the point where my pen is moving, then I know I'm getting a poem. And I might have to throw out the first 20 lines of the poem, but I need to dig through that sediment in order to get to where I have to go. And that's the port, point where I'm knocking the, po po the crow out. At least I hope I'm knocking the crow out. Um, who has been very inspired? Influential during your poetry career. career. Influential in terms of uh, in terms of helping me with my writing, or influential in terms of opening doors, or uh, or people who influence me. People who influenced you. A lot of I read a lot. I, I read a great deal, and. But the writers who have influenced me the most, not that I necessarily write exactly as they write, uh, but people like Sharon Olds, like Adrian Rich, uh, especially the earlier, the, the black, it used to have a black cover. It was called The Fact of a Door Frame. It's a wonderful book. It is poems from 1952 to 1974. I must have read that book a thousand times. And it was as though she was keeping me company in my midnight kitchen, because she was at the same stage in her life. And so her later poems were much more philosophical. That's not really my kind of poems, but the, the, that selected poems really helped me. The other person who helped me a lot was Anne Sexton, not that I ever met Ann Sexton, but I met her through her work. And so I found that very um, good for me because she used the most outrageous uh, similes and metaphors. She would compare two things that didn't seem as though they could be compared. I loved her outrageousness. I loved her willingness to be vulnerable. So I learned a lot from her. The living people who affected me. Not, not so much from reading their books, but from being friends with them. 
Diane De Prima was has been very very important in my life. And you'd say, well, why? You don't even you. She's a hippie, a beat poet. Um, you know, you you have nothing in common. Well, we both love poetry. We both love art. We both love talking about it. We both love reading to crowds. Uh, she is a really, really wise person. She helped me a lot, an enormous amount. Uh, just talking to her, just going on reading tours with her. She got me to go back to painting. I, I just really can't thank her enough. The other person who was very influential in my life was Ruth Stone, who became a very good friend. Uh, before she died, she, we were probably friends for about 25 years. And she was so, I, I just remember walking down the main street, I can't, Nassau Street in Princeton with her. She was, came from a poor family. And so she would come here to do a reading, come to New Jersey to do a reading. And then she'd get scared in the fancy hotel and she'd call me and say, Maria, come and stay with me. Maria, come and stay with me. So I'd go down to Princeton with her. And I'll never forget walking down that Nassau Street with her. She was going to buy dye for her hair. <laughs> she had long hair and she dyed herself a kind of red. She was an absolutely gorgeous young woman. I mean, she looked like Ingrid Bergman. She was just beautiful. And she was still beautiful even when she was older. She died at, I think, 95. Anyway, uh, she says, come down. So, uh, you know, we're like two little kids. We're, and I just loved her sense of humor. I loved the way she loved life. And nothing could stop her. We were walking down laughing like two crazy people on Nassau Street. And then I stayed in her suite. <laughs> and so I slept in the little living room and she slept in the bed. In the morning she gets up and she says, well, I wrote this poem. Do you want to hear it? And <laughs> she read me this poem about trying to make a decision about whether to tile her roof or re-shingle her roof, or have her face lifted. When she, looked in the, when she looked in the mirror in the morning, she saw that her face had fallen. Now, her face had not fallen, but she was hysterical like that. She had that very fey sort of sense of humor. She taught me to laugh again. Uh, she taught me how important. My family taught me that too, but she reminded me how important laughter was in life and how important it was to find that kernel of joy, even in grief, even in everyday life, when sometimes you feel there is no kernel of joy. She taught me to find that again. So that was a wonderful thing. I, I, those two were really have been very, very important in my life, those two people. Um, in your new book, What Blooms in Winter, you divide it into sections. Do you have a specific reason for doing that? Uh, I, a friend of mine suggested I do it. <laughs> terrible, terrible. I'm telling you the truth. Um, but we decided after talking over with about four people that it made sense to divide it up, that otherwise it was going to all run together. So uh, the first section is book bags and galoshes, and a lot of them that deals with being, you know, growing up, growing up poems, poems about Patterson, poems about the things I remembered from when I was a kid. And the second is growing up into adulthood, young marriage um, uh, experiences I had as a young woman. And then uh, uh, also a way in which people who have passed on come back to me, like in a bookstore in Hobart, New York. I suddenly remember my mother, and she, and she had never been to Hobart. She never left Patterson when she left Italy. So she had never been to Hobart, New York. She would have been fascinated by it, but she had never been there. But I swear she came to me in Hobart, New York, and appeared in one of my poems. Suddenly there she was, talking to me again. Um, and it's, this also moves out of myself a little bit, this, this chapter. And then A Season of Loss is really dealing a lot with my husband's death and my sister's death and my mother and father's death and all the people that as you get older, uh, my friends of 45 years, um, as you get older, you lose a lot of people. That's the thing. And you lose them, but they sort of come back to you too. Uh, but you know, we'd, obviously we'd rather have them with us if we could keep them, but you can't always. And then 
the end of this is both a celebration of survival, lemons and roses. So that's Italy for me, and Sicily, and Southern Italy, and my parents, and the place where they came from, and the ways in which we walk through grief into survival, because that's what blooms in winter, isn't it? That spirit that won't die in ourselves. That's what I think blooms in winter. Um, how do you come up with the titles of your poems? Do you create them before or after? Oh, no, usually I, I, I do them right away. Um, sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes you'll notice their prompts. You, you, you'll, you'll see, like, wait a minute. Um, uh, no, well, some of them I do after. Like, we used to call it downtown, remember? It was something I, I wrote about. And then I started that as my first line and decided it was a perfect title. Um, why I love the library. I mean, my titles are very down to earth. And the grammar school graduation photo couldn't be more direct than that, right? And then some, uh, I use a, in order to come up with a title, I use a quote. It's been a week of looking upward, inward, below the surface, and back in time, the New York Times. And then I wrote the poem. This has been the, a year like that for me. And so it's as though I see those lines and they become the entry point to a poem. I didn't know I was going to write a poem like that. Uh, I wrote in my journal when I was reading in South Dakota, today, I, Laura, today I'm in South Dakota, a poem to my sister. I mean, they're not necessarily brilliant uh, uh, things, but... Uh, for me, I like them to be clear. I don't really like esoteric titles any more than I really like esoteric poems. I, I guess I want what I'm saying to be clear, and I want the titles to be clear as well. Um, what is some advice you have for aspiring writers who have trouble revealing what's in their cave? I tell them they don't have to share the poem with anybody else or the writing, whatever it is, whatever form it takes, whether it's prose or whether it's a poem or a prose poem. They don't have to share it with anybody else. They just have to give themselves permission to write the story they have to tell. They have to believe it's important. They have to believe that somebody, that, that it's important to put that down. They might not be willing to put it into the world yet, but they should believe that there's something very, there's a kind of salvation in being able to write it down. For me, I didn't speak. I was so shy. So to be able to write it down was a way of freeing myself from being so shy and not being able to speak or to tell people what I was feeling. So it was the only way I could sort of, you know how I tell the students, seize your power. This was a way for me to mark my place in the world, something I couldn't do because I was always hiding in a corner someplace, trying not to be seen. And it took a long time for me to realize that by writing the poems, I was being seen. And then when I started sending them out and they started getting published and people started writing to me, then I realized I love being seen, actually, much more than I thought. I'm not as shy as I once was. I'm still shy, but, but in weird moments, I'm shy. Like it comes back. I have this little girl who lives inside me. That kid in the raggedy dress is still there, okay? And still shy and still afraid and still without the words to claim her space in the world. So when I think I've left her behind, she shows up. And I think, I thought I got rid of you already, but there she is. So the writing for me is always an excavation, always getting past the crow to the things I, to the things I need to write about. For me, and also because enough people have written to me about my poetry to say that it's helped them, that maybe, that maybe some of these poems need to be out there in the world. I hope so. I hope they are open doors for other people. The way they've opened doors for me, I hope they open doors for other people so they can write about the things that they're afraid to write about. Because I'm afraid a good deal of the time. But I do it anyway. I always think that's my definition of courage. You're scared, but you do it anyway. What is next on your writing schedule? 
oh, <laughs> I never know that except that I've already, I, I'm embarrassed because I actually already have, I, I think probably 25 new poems that are actually polished. And then a whole bunch of poems that are still handwritten. So, I, I, but I'm not gonna publish another book right away, but obviously I'm moving toward another book. I'm not finished yet. I might look finished, but, but I, I'm really not finished yet. One of my high school English teachers, he was probably six years older than I, and he was so nice to me in high school. I was this little foreign looking kid, and he was really great to me. He made me believe that I could write. He made, made me believe that what I had to say was important. And for years, he would, I would have a reading. He lived in New York City, and he taught at Eastside High School in Patterson. His name was Mr. Weiss. And for years, I would do a reading in New York, and there he'd be. He'd be in the front row. But he'd get there first. He'd be in the front row. And one time, I did a reading at SCUNY, which is the City University of New York. I get there, of course, he's sitting in the front row. And people ask me questions after. And he said, you know, I think if you put all your books together, you have written a memoir of your life. And I thought, you know, the guy's right. It is kind of a memoir of my life. And in a way, it's like when you write a memoir and you go back and relook at scenes. Like I find certain things coming back to me, the way 17th Street looked in 1940 or 1942. I find it coming back to me, coming back to me. And uh, there are certain things that will stay with you your whole life. Uh, I, I, and there, you're young yet, but there are still things that you've gone through and that you've experienced that are part of you and will stay as part of you for the rest of your life. You're going to be 70 years old. You're going to look back. You're going to say, remember when I was sitting in that room with that blabby woman who wouldn't <laughs> shut up? <laughs> Why do you believe that poetry matters? Oh, it's mattered so much to me. It's given me courage when I didn't have courage. I can pull a poem out of my pocket when I'm depressed and read it out loud to myself. I don't mean literally pull it out, but you know, I memorized it, so I'm carrying it with me. I love memorizing poems and cat because very often I'll be finding myself sinking a little, you know, feeling a little overwhelmed, and I think, okay, which poem should I read? And so I take a poem out that I don't mean physically take it out, but I take it out of my memory and I say it out loud and suddenly I feel better. I hear the music in it. My spirit lifts right up again and I'm ready to sail. I love language and poetry because of that because in a way it could take you so far in your life so far away from anything that could drag you down. And there's plenty in the world that can drag you down. Just look at Syria right at the moment. Just think of Aleppo. Think of all those people dying. Think of all those people who are now refugees in Europe. Think of all the hunger and starvation in the world, including in our own country. There's so much to drag you down. But sometimes a poem, even when I'm despairing about the world, I will say a poem to myself. And suddenly I think if this could be in the world, then the world can't be completely destroyed. I hope I'm right that the world can. But a, a morning like this morning where everybody wrote such wonderful poems makes me feel there's a lot of hope in the world. And there's a lot of terrible things going on, but there's also a lot of hope. Um, can we just end with you reading one of your favorite poems from your new book? from my new book, just a minute. Let me quickly, because you know, I'm just starting to read basically from, from this, um, just wait one second, kids. <laughs> you know, it's hard to know, you know what I mean? It really, really hard to know.
Okay, I guess I will read. Um, my mother was a brilliant cook, okay? My mother was a brilliant cook. The first time my mother went out to eat was on our 25th wedding anniversary at Scordato's in Patterson. The second time was her 50th anniversary at the Iron Kettle House in Wyckoff. My mother said, I could have cooked that meal better myself, but I knew she was happy, though she would never have admitted it. Once my mother came to Patterson from its Italy in steerage, she was content to stay there. She was a brilliant cook and didn't need to go to restaurants. She loved her house, poor as it was, and never stayed in a motel or took a vacation or wanted to. She was content to offer platter after platter of food to her family gathered in her basement kitchen and to watch them laughing and laughing and talking together while she stood behind them and smiled. And she wasn't a martyr. She really wasn't. She loved cooking. She was, she, was, uh, she was really just an artist of food. And she loved cooking and she loved all of us. And what she wanted more than anything was for us to stay together and be happy and love each other. I mean, she really wanted us to be friends. And everything she did, like she would have us make sugar cookies when we were kids and um, we would do things together because she wanted us to remain friends our whole lives and we did. Uh, when my sister was dying, I went across, she lived across the street from me, and I went across the street and I held her hand. And she would wait for me. She'd wait for me to come. Do you have any concluding thoughts you want to add? Uh, no. You know, it's surprising how sometimes a memory can really make you cry. And... But that's a wonderful thing about writing and poetry, that it can get to those deep places inside you. Most of the places, I mean, think about situation comedies. Everything ends in half an hour or an hour. Everything is solved. Everything's on the surface. Nobody really gets hurt. People don't take love too seriously. They're not, they don't cry for 10 years over something somebody has done. But in real life, people do cry for 10 years. People are wounded seriously, are hurt by other people's carelessness, are hurt by other people's lack of compassion and empathy. Um, and that's what poetry can help us with, dealing with everything that's not so nice in ourselves, uh, the things we wish we hadn't said, things we wish we hadn't done, and the things we wish other people hadn't done, particularly to our children. Because, you know, we, we don't really want to see our children hurt. So, uh, and whether, whether you have children or not, I think most of us don't want to see. We have a passion for animals or we have a passion for children. We don't want to see other people's children hurt either. When we see that picture of that little four-year-old in Aleppo who had been in the bombing and he looks, he's all dirty and he looks shell-shocked, how could we not have compassion for him? and for knowing that that moment will stay in his mind until the day he dies. And he'll stay in our minds till the day we die. Because who could forget that image? Who could go moving on into their lives without realizing there's all this terror going on in the world? Is that good? Yeah, we're all set. Okay.